right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Olivine Thomas from the HRD unit. I don't see the Dean or Ms. Pinnock here, so I'll just start. I want to welcome everybody to the Faculty of Social Sciences and the HRD unit Turn It In training session. I want to thank everybody for attending, but of course, I want to specially thank our two speakers, Dr. Alicia Palmer and Ms. Yolanda Togwell, who are librarians from the main library at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. Really thank these ladies for coming to us here in their spare time and teaching us, helping us in the Faculty of Social Sciences to maintain the standards that we're becoming very proud of. So Dr. Palmer and Ms. Togwell, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Good afternoon, everyone. As was said earlier, we are from the UE Mona Library. And this evening, we'll be sharing with you some of the features of Turnitin. So Turnitin has been touted as a plagiarism detection software. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. For this sec session, there are several things we'll be looking at. We'll touch a little bit on Yubi Mona's plagiarism policy. We'll go into how a lecturer can create an account. We'll also look at adding a course, uploading the assignments for students, and we'll talk a little bit more about how students can upload assignments themselves. We'll look at the originality reports, as well as how we go about interpreting these reports. And of course, we also want to talk about the types of documents that you can upload to turn it in. So let's uh, really begin. So Yui's definition of plagiarism is a very comprehensive one. And it basically talks about the various ways that we can plagiarize. So for example, not acknowledging the words or works of others. Uh, and this can mean anything as simple as paraphrasing somebody's work, but it's done in a cosmetic way. It's also using diagrams and opinions that belong to someone else, but without proper attribution. All right, so those are examples of plagiarism as defined by the UWI. Now, you can also plagiarize your own work. So for example, if you if you had submitted or written something before and you represent this new work as if it was never done before or you quote from this new work without actually citing that this was something that was published or written or created by you before that's also an example of plagiarism so we want to be very careful about that now what exactly is turnitin turnitin is a software that has been around um, since 1997, it's a software that, is, that was created by an American company. And the aim of the software is to basically provide you with enough information to make the determination about whether or not plagiarism has occurred. Now, it's important to note that Turnitin does not tell you that by looking at an individual's um, sample of work that plagiarism has, not, has occurred. What Turnitin will do is provide you with what we call like a similarity index, which says X percentage of this information is from a specific source, and Turnitin will provide you with details on that source. So it's always going to be up to the instructor to determine, based on the definitions that we have of what plagiarism entails, if plagiarism has occurred. So Turnitin will never tell you that this work has been plagiarized, but it will show you the index of how many similarities have been found in this bit of documentation or this paper that has been um, submitted. I want to make very clear that actually using the Turnitin um, software, it's, it's not very difficult to use. It looks very overwhelming because there's a lot of information available, but I just want to make you aware that it's something that is pretty easy to use. And as we go through, at the end of this session, it is our hope that we can at least log into Turnitin and kind of show you what it looks from the instructor's standpoint or the lecturer's standpoint. And we'll talk a little bit as well about the student's um, perspective of Turnitin. 
So the most important thing when using Turnitin is to ensure that you have an account. For lectures at the UWI, one of the ways that you get access to Turnitin is by getting your credentials from MITS. And I'll share with you in a moment um, the contact details that you will need to request this information. Now, there are three types of accounts that can be created on Turnitin. There's a student account, the teaching assistant account, and what is called an instructor account. So these accounts are the three basic types of account, and for our purposes, we're looking at the student and the instructor account. Now it must be noted that a student account does not exist independent of the instructor's account. What this means is that in order for a student to get access to Turnitin, it is the lecturer who has to send out this information. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Now, to join Turnitin as an instructor, as I hinted at before, you will need to contact the Turnitin administrator um, at UWI. And for our purposes, this administrator can be reached at elearning at uwimona.edu.jm. Once you have made this contact, you'll write an email stating that I would like to get access to UWI's Turnitin account. And what will happen is that the administrator will um, provide you with an instruction email that tells you exactly what to do in order to set up um, your account. Now, you'll get this information that says um, check your email and the subject line should show um, your Turnitin instructor account. You're going to click on the get started button and the instructions are very intuitive because it will tell you what you need to do to set up in essence what is considered your account um, your account page. Now once in your 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 email you will see the caption, create your Turnitin account. You'll follow the link that has been provided. You'll create a password and this password will be of your choosing. But what is important is that you must have a password that is not easily accessible. So typically between six to 12 um, characters in length. And you want to make sure that um, no one is able to access your account very quickly. And that's as simple as, um, that's a simple process of getting into Turnitin, Turnitin in your Turnitin account. Now, this is essentially what you will see. This is what you're seeing on your screen is the login um, page for Turnitin. Now, this login page, you will put in your email address and your password that you created um, previously. And this is if you had a Turnitin account before, but if you don't have a Turnitin account, then what you will do is you'll click on the new user icon. And if you notice, right beside the new user icon, you will see click here. You'll click on that link and it will take you into signing up for Turnitin. And of course, you use the credentials that you were provided by the, the university's Turnitin administrator. Now, one of the main reasons we are using Turnitin is because we want to be able to check our students' work to ensure that we can make the determination of whether or not they have plagiarized. In order to do this, we need to create what is called a class in Turnitin. Once you log into your account, and I'll show you um, as soon as I'm done going through this presentation, what you'll see is an add class button, and this will allow you to start creating a class. Once that has been done, you're going to create a new class page, and a class name and enrollment key will be entered. You will choose what your class name is, and you will choose what your enrollment key is. Now the class name, can be your um, the class that you're teaching. You decide if you want to use the exact name of the class, a shortened version, 
of the class's name, and then you will choose an enrollment key. It can be any number or character that you choose. And once you have done that, that will be your class name and enrollment key for that class that you have created. You're also able to create more than one class in your Turnitin account. So say for example, you're teaching three or four uh, different classes and you want content or information or assignments that have been submitted, you want them submitted to that specific class, then you will create a Turnitin class for those submissions. So you can have several classes at the same time in your Turnitin assignment or a Turnitin um, classroom, sorry. Now, it's important to note that each class has a start date and an end date. Typically, your start date will be the date that you created um, that class and the end date will be your choosing. Now, Turnitin typically defaults to six months because the expectation is that after six months, a class would have ended anyway. So you want to pay keen attention that your end date is not shorter than the duration of your class. Once you have filled in that information, then you're going to hit submit. And what you have done is you have created a class in Turnitin. Now, your class ID and enrollment um, key are very important. Once you have created that class, the class ID and the enrollment key will always be available to you. And there are several ways that you can allow students to have access to this information so that they can get a profile in Turnitin. You can email your students from within Turnitin, or you can um, tell your students what the class ID is and enrollment key. The easier process might be to email students from within Turnitin, but this would, this would mean that you would have to ensure that you have your students um, added to your class, all right? And we can talk a little bit about that um, in a bit. Now, you have created your class. How did you get to create your class? The first thing you had to do was to ensure that you got permission from you as Turnitin administrator to create an account. You created your account, you chose your password, you logged in, and then once you logged in, you went on to create a class. But a class is of no use if you're not able to have students submit their assignments. And so you will need to create an assignment in Turnitin because when students upload their information, or upload their assignments, what they're uploading their assignments to is that particular assignment that you have created in your Turnitin account. Now, how do I do this? Once you're in your Turnitin um, page, there's an add assignment button. Turnitin is set up in such a way that the buttons and icons that you need to see or you need to see in order to be able to create your assignments and create your class, they're easily accessible. And as you enter Turnitin, you'll see them. So you won't have to search for it because as you log in, create your classroom and create your assignment, you will see the icons that you need to use to make it work for you. Now Turnitin requires that you enter an assignment title. So in essence, you're creating this assignment. So you'll enter a title, you'll choose a start date and due date for the submission of that assignment. Now you have to be careful with, this, with the um, end dates for the assignment because if the end date of the assignment is sooner than you would um, like your students to submit, when a student goes after the date, so say for example, you have told your students that you would want them to submit their assignments by the 30th of May, but you forgot to adjust the due date to the 30th, but you had the 15th instead. When the student goes to submit that assignment, they would not, not be allowed to submit. So we have to pay specific attention to the start date and the due date for the assignment. Now, by default, Turnitin will say, okay, 
allow only the file types that Turnitin can check for similarity. So in other words, we know that there are different types of files that individuals can create and automatically Turnitin has pre-selected this where you only allow file types that can be checked for similarity. Now you can choose to uncheck that option, meaning that you can say, okay, it doesn't matter what file type my student uses, I want to still allow them to submit it. Or you can do as Turnitin has suggested, that you check the, the icon that says, only allow those file types that Turnitin can check for similarity. Now, since we're using the service for similarity check, it would be much easier for you to just leave the default option. Now, there are different types of assignments that um, can be created in Turnitin, but the license that UE has doesn't allow for certain um, types of grading or marking, and I'll talk about that in, in, a, in a bit. Essentially, what UE has is Turnitin that the Turnitin license that we, we have only allows us to check for similarity. In other words, when the assignment is uploaded, you can check your similarity, check for your similarity report. You can see how many times this individual's work has been found elsewhere. You can download the report, you can upload an assignment. But the grading features that are available in Turnitin, we do not currently have those turned on. So we use Turnitin just for checking to ensure that our students are not plagiarized. Now, as I mentioned before, an individual might opt to upload different file types. Now, here are some common file types that Turnitin accepts um, for the most part. Many students use um, Word documents, Microsoft Word documents, or they'll upload um, PDFs, but Turnitin allows you to also upload other types, and these are listed um, here. We have the rich text format, WordPerfect, HTML, but I think to make it much um, simpler for our students, we might want to just stick to Microsoft Word and um, PDFs. Now, UWI does not have licenses to really allow all students to upload their assignments to turn it in. So I want to kind of emphasize that. So what happens is that an instructor or a lecturer can opt to upload a student's assignment, or they can allow students to upload the assignments from their profiles. So I just want to make that um, very clear. All right. But just in case you want to submit an assignment for your student, um, this is the main way that you would do it. In your Turnitin account, you will see a submit paper button. And it's typically to the right of the assignment link. And a drop down box will be provided. You'll state the name of the student, you'll um, give a title to the paper, and this will typically be based on what, the tit what title the student has used, and then you'll have an option of uploading the paper, which essentially means clicking the upload button to upload the paper. You'll pick from either your computers, um, from your desktop, Dropbox, or Google Drive. Those are the three three locations that Turnitin allows you to pull documents from to upload into Turnitin. Dropbox, your computer, and Google Drive. And for the most part, um, that's pretty easy to access. Everything is a drop-down menu, and you'll see the options. So for example, for Google Drive, you'll see an icon with Google Drive and it will allow you to click on it and it will open Google Drive on your computer. The same goes for Dropbox, if you have a Dropbox account. Um, in no way are you being advised to get a Dropbox account or get a Google Drive account. Um, you can upload the material or the assignment from your computer, that's perfectly acceptable. Once you're finished, click the upload button 
and you have uploaded um, the paper. Now I know you might have questions about, do I get a receipt when I upload? If an instructor or a lecturer decides to upload a paper for a student, every time you upload a paper, Turnitin provides you with a receipt. There are two ways that you can access that receipt. You can highlight or um, you can copy the receipt and save it. Or you can go back to the assignment icon and click download. So there are different ways that you can get access to that receipt. So if, for example, you chose to upload an assignment for a student and you're wondering how do I give the student a receipt, Turnitin does provide you with a receipt. And it's as simple as copy and paste in the content and emailing it to your student. And you can email from within Turnitin or you can download the receipt. Similarly, when students upload a Turnitin document, to, a document to Turnitin, sorry, they also get an, a, rec a receipt, and that receipt can be submitted to their lecturer to show that they actually did um, submit their assignment through Turnitin, all right? Now, Turnitin has what is called a feedback studio. Now, the feedback studio, has several features that are available for use. What we checked, what we realized when we were preparing um, for this session was that many of these features are not accessible to us because the grading feature, we do not have a license for that. So we have included this information just to let you know about the range of options that are available um, within Turnitin and the Feedback Studio is one of them. So you will have access to the Feedback Studio, but you'll basically be using the Feedback Studio only for looking at the similarity reports. So once an assignment is uploaded, you will be placed in the Feedback Studio. It's just that the grading aspect of the Feedback Studio is not accessible to us here at UWI. And those are licensing, um, issues. So only certain features of Turnitin are available. Similar to, to um, Moodle or, or VLE container, only the features that are relevant to us would um, be selected, for example. Now, you're wondering what is the originality check? Now, the originality check is basically the process that Turnitin uses to check information that has been submitted or papers that have been submitted against publicly accessible files. So imagine uploading a document to turn it in. Once it is uploaded, after a few moments, it doesn't happen automatically. It takes uh, uh, some time and you'll have to refresh. What you'll find is that Turnitin will check this document against other sources of information that's available. So for example, it will check journals, it will check documents that have been submitted to other universities. Um, it will check documents that have been submitted to Turnitin. And when we talk about documents that have been submitted to other universities, we're talking about their use of Turnitin. So if their students submit a paper, and for some reason, and I, we hope our students won't do that, but uh, one of our students happens to have submitted the same paper, Turnitin will pick that up. It will flag it as being something that has been taken from another source. And it will tell you the percentage of the information that comes from that source. Turnitin also gives you the option to contact that institution. The only drawback is that if you make a request to see the document that the student has such a large um, similarity, similarity um, percentage from, Turnitin won't show you that document. What they will do is they will make a request on your behalf stating that you would like to have access to that documentation. And then once it is available, if it's made available, then um, they will inform you of that. Now, the percentages that you see when you are looking at your match overview, what is this all about? 
it is important to note that Turnitin does not check for plagiarism. I want to make that absolutely clear. Even though it's touted as a plagiarism detection software, and yes, Turnitin does allow you to detect, detect plagiarism, Turnitin doesn't check for plagiarism. So similarity and plagiarism don't necessarily mean the same thing. What Turnitin does is think of it as a database that is running um, your assignments to check to see if it occurs in any other um, database or in any other journals, in any other website. That is what Turnitin is doing. You have to make that determination as to whether or not plagiarism has occurred. Turnitin will not tell you that. And I'll talk a little bit more about the percentages in a moment because um, it, it's helpful to have lecturers determine what is considered plagiarism for them. And this is an individual thing, and I'll tell you why I say that. Say a student has submitted a paper, and in setting up your assignment, you didn't exclude for um, certain things like um, reference lists and so on. The student's reference list would automatically come up as something that has a high similarity index because these are works that have been done before, and obviously Turnitin will pick that up. And so these are a few nuances that one has to pay attention to when using Turnitin. So first we have to make a determination of what percentage would be considered plagiarism. And there are several factors that we have to um, look at. So once Turnitin has checked these websites and journals, and it has access to information from a wide range of journals. I can't really tell you what those journals are, but it tells itself as having access to a wide range of journals. So if a student um, plagiarizes, Turnitin will pick that up as a similarity and it will be up to the lecturer to look at that particular percentage to see if it's a case that the student was um, quoting directly, but they did not cite um, their source, or cite correctly, use the proper um, citation method, and if that's the case, then that would be plagiarism. All right, let's continue. Now, in order to interpret the similarity um, report, what Turnitin does is it uses a color coding system. And the colors are blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. So let's start off with blue. It is not likely that a student will ever get no matching text. It's not likely. Once a student has cited his or her paper correctly, there's always something that's going to come up as a similarity. Because in essence, there's no new information that the student would have presented without citing other sources of information. So while a section in that document might be presented as blue, the entire document will never produce a no match. And that is what blue essentially means. Some individuals have said that if a student's assignment ranges from one word to 24% in terms of matching text, that means that the student has not plagiarized. One can argue that by being within the zero or the one word, to 49% range, you could pretty much be safe and say that the student has a, a high likelihood of not plagiarizing. But the issue with that is that in order to make that determination, you would need to look at the text itself to see where these high percentages are coming from. You can't say that because a student only gets a 24% matching text that the student has not plagiarized. So what will happen is that you will need to look at the text itself to see, is it a reference that the person is coming up with this 24% match? Is it a series of references? Is it that the person has copied and pasted information from a source? Is it that um, the person has copied wholesale information from somewhere else? You won't know until you look at the information. Turnitin will not interpret that for you. You will need to make that determination. Say a student has a 50% matching text in one section of a paper. 
But when the lecturer looks at the paper, they realize that the person was, the student was doing what is called a direct quotation or the direct quote. And it happened to be a direct quote, quote from a source and they quoted it correctly and so on. But this particular example would show that the student has not plagiarized because they have cited the work correctly. Would you then say that because the person had a 50 to 74% match that they have plagiarized, one would have to double check the entire paper to see what else is coming up as something that has not been correctly cited. Because if a student has not um, cited the work correctly or cited any at all, that is plagiarism. And so that determination has to be made by the lecturer. Now, the red zone, the red matching text, 75% to 100%. One could safely surmise that such a high index would mean that plagiarism has occurred. Because if you're seeing a 100% um, matching index coming up for a student, right there, that's a red flag. I don't think you would even need to go and look any further because it would mean that there's no original information in this paper and all of this paper has been previously submitted before. So you, one would want to send that student to the drawing board, but again, it would kind of be in our best interest to double check to see what is going on um, within that paper. So just to recap, to be safe, the blue and green zones are typically okay, but we still need to check the information. It's less likely that the student would have plagiarized. Um, even accidental plagiarism is still plagiarism. The yellow, to red, the yellow to red zones, we need to be extra careful and double check to see where these similarity matches are occurring. Again, Turnitin will not tell you that your student has um, plagiarized. All right, let's look at some examples. Now, every student is unique um, in terms of the interpretation um, of their work. So what do I mean by this? A student could have submitted a paper to your class before in the past and it was submitted to Turnitin, but if they had their name on the submission, it is possible that if the lecturer when setting up the assignment does not include for small matches, so say for example, you could say you're giving your students 20 words or 10 words that could actually come up that have been used before, what would happen is that Turnitin would exclude these 10 words or these 10 matches, so the student's name would not show up as um, being similar. So in this case, to fix this issue, excluding five words, for example, would safely exclude a student's name from being highlighted in their similarity report. Now Turnitin will not um, view simple words like at, it, but those small words as being um, words that are, are similar and likely to have been plagiarized. It won't, it won't look at those words. It's going to be looking at direct or exact phrases that have been used for the similarity index to be populated. Now, another example might be a student has um, submitted Turnitin. We know we have some of our students who are kind of worried about their assignments. And so they submit three or four times. This again could result in a 100% um, score, which in essence, the lecturer wouldn't have to look at the paper again. They would probably say, oh, this is 100%. There's no way the student has not plagiarized. But because the student submitted on multiple occasions, it's going to show that. And so what would likely happen is that um, the lecturer could exclude the previous submissions or you could delete the submissions that have been um, done before and leave um, only one submission and then rerun that report so that you don't get that 100% um, similarity. Right. Now, Turnitin allows you to download your similarity report. As I said before, pretty much everything in Turnitin the icons are easily accessible and it will show you what you need to do to be able to 
um, download the information. But here's a quick run through. Once you open a submission, it opens in the feedback um, studio area, and there's a, an icon, which is basically a down arrow, and what it will do is once you click on it, it will allow you to download the similarity um, report. Now, in terms of um, what the report will entail, the report will tell you what is the percentage of the similarity that has occurred in this assignment, right? And it will also show you the color codes, and you, com you can compare it to the rest of the document, and it will allow you to kind of match the rest of the paper to see what is going on. Again, um, Turnitin provides a very simple document that shows you, okay, here's the percentage um, of similarity that has occurred, and the lecturer has to make that determination as to what um, plagiarism means for this particular paper. An 87% similarity index or 87% similarity means that the lecturer will have to look at that paper keenly. And it is extremely likely that a student has plagiarized if you have such a high index. But again, Turnitin will not tell you that your student has plagiarized. That is a determination that you will have to make in terms of what percentage would be considered um, plagiarism. And you can click on each source um, that has been considered too similar or the similarity index comes up for. Now, let's look at this example of what is called a match overview. In shortened form, the match overview tells you, one, the sources of information um, that have produced a similarity index. It also gives you a color code, and it also tells you the percentage. Now, if you look to the left of the match overview box, you'll see a few icons. Now, I, in this example, you will see what looks like a paper and a pen, and that would allow you to kind of gr allow for grading and making comments. Again, that grade feature is not in our um, Turnitin license. And so even though it's showing up here, when you go into Turnitin, some of those features would not show up. So the areas that would be of interest to you would be um, the match overview with the percentages, and the options to download the paper. And at the bottom, just below 43, that is where you will see that option to download your similarity um, report. Now, you can click on the numerical similarity score from the similarity toolbar. And what it does is once you click on it, you will see the text highlighted. And you can also get more information as to where that text comes from. Turnitin is very good in terms of telling you the source of information. And if you need to get more information to access that document that the, the similarity is based on, you can also get that information. Now I have here an example of a paper that has been submitted. I found that Turnitin did not have um, very good examples of a paper that highlighted the different colors and so on in terms of what the percentages mean. And so I wanted to show this example. Now in this paper, there's a 58% match in terms of similarity, All right? So one would look at the various sources first to see if these are sources of information that our students should even be citing information from as well as to determine why is our student having such a high similarity um, index from the document. Now, in this particular case, the student apparently wrote verbatim um, words that were taken from another source, and so it is showing up um, this in our similarity or match overview um, on the right of the document. So if you notice, there are no quotation marks um, for, for the most part, except for one small segment of the paper. And even though the student used quotation marks for, an, for a segment, they did not use any sources of information at all. And so 
this is li it's likely that the student has um, plagiarized or taken information directly or stolen information from another source of information. Because once you have not cited this information, what you have done is you have stolen this information from somewhere else. And again, you always want to check your match um, index to see what is going on with that specific um, similarity. All right. I've talked a bit about the match breakdown. Um, the match breakdown is pretty simple. It tells you where the source is from, where is this information coming from, and what percentage of this paper is from this source. Now, um, in this particular example, the student would have got information from wikipedia.org. Um, one would have to determine, has the student cited this information correctly? But another thing as well, we don't want our students citing from Wikipedia because anybody with an opinion can upload material to Wikipedia and it becomes a source of information. So that's not typically something that we want our students to do anyway. So even if that student had quoted that information or cited that information um, perfectly, it would still be information that we'd probably want to tell our students to exclude um, because that is, not a, that is not an appropriate source for us to be citing credible information, what we consider to be um, credible information. All right, again, let's look at this example. What you're seeing on your screen is what is called a, a source box. And what it is, is that it appears on the paper and it reveals the source of the information. And this is just a more specific example of um, the student getting information from wikipedia.org and this source box is just providing you with that information. You can click on it and it will take you directly um, to the source. Right. So in a nutshell, those are the basic areas of Turnitin. So before I go on to log in to turn it in itself, if there are any questions, I can take a few of those questions and then I'm going to attempt to show you a practical example of logging into turn it in and um, creating an assignment. I just had a, a small question. I just wanted you to confirm for me that you said you could so one lecturer who teaches two or three courses can have two or three classes simultaneously in Turnitin. Yes, you can, because what you're doing is um, you're creating a class. So there's an, yes, there's an clear. option. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying I wasn't clear. It, it sounded as if like you had to create a big class and then create some subclasses. Is that how it worked? No, it's, it's not really um, a subclass. So what happens is when you log into Turnitin, you're going to see the University of the um, West Indies. So that's the institution. And then you're going to go in and you're going to create a class. But there's also the option to create other classes. So if I have a class called Educational Technology, for example, my Educational Technology students can submit their assignments to that because I'd send them the credentials and the information for that. But then I could also create an assignment um, or create a class for another group of students that would have another name. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I am hoping I'll see it when you're doing the, the demonstration. But we do have some other questions. Um, Enid Bessemer is asking, what about quotations from newspapers? Are those acceptable? Um, and I thought I saw another one. Can I, okay. can I or should I put up my hand? Well, um, Dr. Palmer, what, um, what about the newspapers? Are those acceptable? So newspapers can be an acceptable source of information. It, it, it depends on what type of newspaper. Um, so for example, in our Jamaican context, um, if you look at the Gleaner versus the Star, the Gleaner or the Observer would probably be considered a more credible source of information, whereas the Star would not necessarily be so. But that's not really a Turnitin, um, that's not really a Turnitin question. That's more a sources of information question. 
Okay. But yes, yeah, newspapers can be used. It depends on the credibility of the newspaper. All right, I see Denny. Denny All right, can I? And I see Trevor Smith. Okay. Denny, what about you? Good, yeah, good evening, everybody. Good evening. So when, when you submit your paper, are you given time to correct it? Because, I mean, do you get a test run? I'm not, no, I'm not aware of a test run being provided, but a student could also always ask a lecturer if they can resubmit. Okay. Dr. Smith? Because maybe the student, the student didn't intentionally, well, you might, the score might be high, although mm. you didn't steal any information, but you would like mm -hmm. to see where, what errors you made or whatever. All right, so um, in the example that I gave of a student who had the 100% score, the reason for that was that the student had submitted the assignment over and over. So in that particular case, the student had been allowed to submit um, the assignment several times. And so the, the lecturer would have had to delete those assignments um, in order for, this, for, this, for them to run another report and get a lower similarity index. Um, typically, you wouldn't advise students to submit their paper until they are ready to submit. The, the, the hope would be that the student would be paying particular attention to citing sources correctly and so by the time they get to the point of submitting um they would have correctly cited their information and so avoid the issue of having a large similarity index because they have submitted several times i don't know if that um, answers your question okay i All don't right. think if, if this required score is like 20 percent and you are 25 mm -hmm. that, that's out of close all right, so if you, if you get a similarity index of 25%, as I said before, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have plagiarized. And so it's always going to be dependent on the lecturer to double check to see why is, there, um, why is this percentage showing up? Because it doesn't necessarily mean that the student has plagiarized. It could mean that the lecturer did not exclude for um, small words, for example, or the reference list um, is coming up as something that has been um, found somewhere else. So that's where the similarity is coming in, and so the high number. And so you can't just look at a percentage and say, yes, the student has plagiarized because you see a high similarity index. In only cases where you see probably 50 to 100%, you might be saying, oh, the student is likely half the student has likely plagiarized, but you still would have to go and look at it to see what's going on. Yeah, that, thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So, all right. I'm just, I'm just I thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking here about the inexact science in in Turnitin. Right. And I'm wondering here. Mm -hmm. Can I beat Turnitin by copying a phrase verbatim and then from a document and add simple words like and or at so as to because I know Turnitin doesn't check those simple words so as to keep, mm -hmm. keep it in the blue or the green zone mm -hmm. so I, I'm copying the phrase right mm -hmm. I'm stealing the phrase from elsewhere and then I put in some uh, at or an R O O R are some simple words so as uh -huh. to change the phrase. Couldn't I beat Turnitin in that way? It's not very likely because even though you're adding those small words, the bigger portion of what you have presented is a verbatim copy of um, information that you have taken from elsewhere. So no, it's see, I present like five a phrase with five words. I just it just looks nice from somewhere and I just use those five words and then I put in, I punctuate it with and or, or or something like that to change it up slightly. I'm using somebody else's phrase. Cosmetic paraphrasing. Yeah, that would Cosmetic, be Cosmetic, wouldn't I be able to know, get into the green zone, so to speak, or the blue zone by manipulating that? Because, you know, 
I just wondered if you can manipulate it. it. It just looks to me something that can be manipulated. Or I could perhaps, instead of, for instance, I can do less referencing, less citation, per se. I could do less citation so that it doesn't, it keeps me in one of the lower zones. And then I change up words in between to keep, you know, it looked to me like something that can easily be manipulated. I would love to check it in terms of do some exploratory on turn it in. Has any exploratory been done in terms of how you can manipulate it? Because it looks like that to me, you know? But tell me, what has been your experience with all of the manipulation of it? One of the things I would say, though, Doc, is that I think Turnitin might only be one means by which assignments are checked. You would think that the lecturer also knows the literature. So if you were to be putting things in, you would think that the lecturer may have read those sources or some of them. Um, if it is something, but the point is, though, that the lecturer should be also able to give a judgment. That's my thought on it. When I have had two grade papers, I also have a sense of what the students have done. In fact, sometimes when I think it is too good, I actually go on Google, just copy what they have done, put it in Google, and sometimes I found the source there because you can see the unevenness in the writing. So I'm just thinking Turnitin might only be one tool that you use. But isn't it too much work for you to be in Turnitin and then go Google to find out again? Isn't it too much work for the lecturers? Boy, Doc, I think it's, for Holiday. me, the lesser of the two evils. Holiday. No, I was just saying that I think for me, it's lesser of two evils. Um, Rohan is saying something. Rohan has something yeah. to add to that. Yeah, so to the point that that's, Doc is, is, is questioning. So what I've actually seen is if the person puts the and and simple words like those, because when the result comes, it brings, a it brings back a string. So take, for example, it may read an entire sentence or an entire paragraph. And uh, those words that are changed, the and and stuff may not necessarily appear, but when you look at, at an entire sentence appears, so you will also recognize that, hmm, these were the things that they did change in, in the text. If you see what, if you follow what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I'm understanding, you know. Right, I so think, you will pick up, if it's a, a two sentences, you will see a particular sequence that there is the same thing, but you'll also identify that, hmm, the word uh, and was changed to something else or another word was changed to something else. But in looking at the entire string, you will see the similarity there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, I'm that's, just, that's how I use it. That's it could, I be, it, it that's could be very onerous on the part of the lecturer because if you have to be doing that kind of forensic type of assessment to make sure after having gone through the software, particularly in the case like us in Mona School where we have large numbers in terms of our classes and so, it becomes a bit much. Yeah, just, I've, not, I've not had to go to, to the extent that Olivine explained there in terms of looking back, you know, in another search engine. But within Turnitin itself, as I say, you can see a particular pattern. So it picks up an entire sentence, an entire paragraph, two sentences, three sentences, yes. and then can show if a word or two, or probably said two, three words in a line were, were, were changed. Right. And notably, I see where you can drop the reference list at the so as to again to keep you your score within the green zone, you know, dropping reference list and so forth. So as to I my yeah, because percentages. because I've, play, seen, can be I've seen that the reference list could be correct, but mm -hmm. then if it's a widely sourced piece of reference, it will it will come up, it will be flagged. And it may increase that 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 score that you know percentages. Want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Dr. Martin Hall, is there a size limit to the document that can be submitted in Turnitin? And Franklin Wap is asking whether students quoting the lecturer is that credible. 
So quoting their lecture notes, not necessarily some published work. Well, Alvin, well, Dr. Palmer, for the last, I, I don't know how to answer the, the, the first question, but for the last question, based on what I've seen using APA, it allows for it. So even probably Turnitin picks up that it may be the lecture note or personal note from the student. Some of that is taken into consideration or should be taken into consideration based on citation style. Dr. Gatcher, I allow students um, to submit multiple times. This is a feature you can set when setting up assignments. Okay, so we've learned that. And June Pinto, is a student able to delete a previous submission or, is the or does the lecturer have to do this for the student? Does anybody know? Doc? Hi, Olivine. Oh, hello. This is not dark, of course. Uh -huh. um, having used it as a student, I recognize that when you're using it, when you're submitting, it allows you only one time to do so. It, as far as I know, depending on how the lecturer sets it. Um, so sometimes I think you've been, uh, you are asked to double check if everything is okay before you do so. But as it relates to when you're getting out of the zones, I think between blue and green, it allows you the opportunity to see where you may have plagiarized, whether deliberately or otherwise. So even if you change some, put in some words like is and not and so on, it tends not to accept it. So in my case, I've had to actually reword the whole thing. I think as the question relates to the submission being deleted by the student, um, as part of the presentation, we were going to show the instructor side of things and the student side of things, where the option being seen on the student side of things does not allow them to delete it, only to actually delete the class. That's what we are seeing based on our little demo that we had done. So um, I'm signing for the, for the student part, so I can show what the student sees since most persons inside are in the session are actually lecturers. So I could actually just do that until she works that out. If not, what will happen is I can sign out as the, the student after that part. And if she still doesn't get in, I'll try to sign in as an instructor also. Right, so I'm actually signed in as a student um, on this end. But what had happened was um, Dr. Palman and I she had actually sent me uh, an invite and she, she added me to her actual course. And um, what usually happens is the student will receive a welcome message and they're able to actually set up their account. So with the password and the actual setup at the end and they'll receive messages as they go along. So it's pretty easy, but you must have a class. So the first part of it that Dr. Palmer should have done, would, would, that will do, she'll do if she gets to come back on, has to do with the fact that um, she has to create the class. So once she creates the class, the class is there for the student. She can offer to give the student the enrollment key, as it was indicated in the presentation, as well as the class ID. So if you notice from my screen, you're seeing my screen, right? Hello? Yes, yes, we are. Right. So on this side here, you notice that, so this was a class, the educational technology. And um, of course, we have an instructor um, email there. And um, this is a class ID that would have been supplied by the lecturer. So you have the option when you log in as a lecturer to actually give the send the students emails so you're able to send the students the class ID and the enrollment key, right? Other than that, you can actually add them in the, in, the, in, the, in the container. Now, from there, what happens is once they have been set up in the account, they have the option of actually 
seeing the tabs here. So all my classes, I'm only enrolled for one class. It's only one class that is there. A question was asked earlier about whether you have to create sub classes. No, each class has its individual identity because when you're setting up, you choose the, you, you choose the actual password. And from that, the software gives you the enrollment key and the class ID that can be used. It generates that for you, right? If you want to, the student has the option to of enrolling in the class. So if you see the tabs at the top left-hand corner there, they have the option of clicking on that that says enroll in the class. So here's where they'd actually put in the class ID and the enrollment key there and submit. All right. Once this information has been submitted, they can contact their instructor. In addition to that, it has an option to um, where it says what is plagiarism and it automatically goes to plagiarism.org. So the student is able to see that particular um, interface there. So, of course, everything you have to be really connected to. Um, sorry. to the internet to view that, all right? Um, this is actually a support center that is there. It's a support center.turnitin.com because when you actually go into, let me go back to this here. When you're in the account, it says that you can actually get help, right? But for whatever reason, that key doesn't work very well. I don't know, it seems as if it has been um, disabled. So there's actually another screen that you can go, an actual website that you can go to get that information. You have the option of sending messages to the students. So at the top there, the students will see the messages that the instructor actually sends out. So they're there. So in my case, there are no announcements or messages. All right, for the user information, this is the section that the student can actually change their password. It also allows them at this point to change from single file upload to things like multiple file upload and so on. And if it's a zip file and so on. So it defaults to single file upload. That's really what happens with the, with the thing. So if I go back to all classes, what happens here is if I click on the class, so this is a class that was created. So this is the assignment that was created. Once I click on the assignment here, this is the option here that tells you that you can actually submit. So you're able, the student is able to view the paper that they're going to be submitting. But what they do, if they click on submit here, this is the interface that they see. So they should really and truly at this point in time, make sure that they really want to submit their paper so they don't have the the um situation where that's not what they really wanted and then um they are not able to delete from their side so the options are there to choose the file from your computer to choose from dropbox or to choose from the google drive right um if i go back here i have a question yes the, the submit you're referring to there right now and from the student end, is that submit to the lecture or as yes, I Yes, submit it, to submit the class. To turn it in for review. To submit to the class. Because based on the discussion thus far, from what I recall, you would have at least uh, one submission uh, per 24 hour period. Um, right. So you could have submitted it to turn it in, get the review, say the similarity that was required was 10 to 10, you, re you realize it's 15. And then you can go back, probably rephrase, edit, whatever the case may be, and resubmit within the next 24 hour cycle and get a different um, similarity index before you actually submit to the lecturer. But when you go to submit, it would mean that um, I think you can only, the lecturer, if you submit, you're submitting for Turnitin to give you that report, the similarity report, based on what we understand from our end. And um, it is a lecturer now, if you want to do, if you end up not wanting that one, you would have to contact the lecturer to be able to remove that particular um, paper. 
there are no options here apart from dropping the class as far as we are seeing on our end. But if you if you submit to multiple times, doesn't it? It, it's, so, so in Dr. Palmer's presentation, um, she pointed out that if the student submits similar, um, multiple times, what will happen is that it's going to end up giving you 100% because it's seen that particular paper in the database already. So the previous submissions would have to be deleted by the lecturer so that only the current submission would be viewed by eternity. Therefore, based on what you're saying, there's no op option for the student to interact with Turnitin multiple times prior to submission to the lecture. Not that we are seeing on this end. Okay, duly noted. All right, just note that if the lecturer allows multiple submissions, you're going to get a similarity report that shows 100%. I thought that there was something about saving to turn it in and that you got the 100% if you saved, but if you didn't save the document, then it would not show up in the percentages. Or if you, sh if, if you were looking at um, the screen that Mr. Wall was showing from the student phasing in, it just only shows, in, based on our license, it just only shows a submit button. So there are no other options that are showing up. And when we log in as a student, that says that we, we can save it. I know typically um, Turnitin would allow students to submit like three times, typically. But when we, went to, when we tested a paper and went in to submit, the only option we were seeing was submit. There was no save option. So I don't know if because we were entering as, uh, we were just testing, entering as individuals who were testing as opposed to having a student ID, I don't know if that accounts for that. But when we tried to submit, um, being a student that was registered in a course that we set up, we did not see that option to, um, to save instead of submit. Okay, all right. Yeah. And besides, I mean, the license may also have changed. You is license. Right, and I know, I know there are some changes have occurred with um, Turnitin. So I'm not sure if that's one of the changes, but when we, when we went to log in as a student and to test the submission piece, we were not seeing a save option. And I don't think um, when Mr. Will showed it a while ago that um, I saw that either. So I'm, I'm not really sure. But I know typically Turnitin would have allowed um, three submissions and then you'd have to wait 24 hours I know the fact that a student can get a 100% because they have previously submitted documentation, it would be because the lecturer has allowed them to submit more than once, which would then trigger the 100% um, percent in terms of the similarity index. But in terms of saving the, document, the assignment instead of um, submitting it, we were not seeing that when we logged in as students. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right, so I'm going to log in um, from the lecturer's point of view. I'm hoping that you're able to see my screen. Again, this is the login into Turnitin. By now, the lecturer would have had an, um, a, an account which they created using their email and a password. So you would click login. Once you log in to Turnitin, it takes a moment or so. It will take you into your, um, your classroom. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to demonstrate um, how to, to add a class. So as you can see from my screen, we already have a class and there's a class ID for that class. Now I'm going to add a class so that you can see. So as I said, the buttons are pretty visible. visible. So you click on add a class, a drop down menu would populate and you would go ahead and create the class. I'm just gonna quickly try to um, demonstrate that. So I'm gonna create a class called test. I'm going to use an enrollment key of the zeros. Then I'm gonna choose my subject area. And then I'm gonna choose my students. So let's just say graduates. 
and I have no option in terms of choosing a start date because my start date automatically becomes the day that I create the class. And then I would click submit. So I fill in my information, create my um, enrollment key, and click submit. So once the class is created, you'll see the class ID and the enrollment key. So I'm gonna click continue. Now a question was raised earlier about whether or not you can have more than one class. As you can see in my um, Turnitin account, you will see that we have two classes. The one that was created before and the one that I um, just created. So what would happen is that you would then um, give students the enrollment key for each class because there are two different classes and you want the assignments to be directed to the specific class. Just some key things that um, we want to pay attention to. To the right of the screen, you'll see an edit button um, that looks like a gear button. We're gonna click on that. And the reason I'm doing that is because if you want to find out um, what your enrollment key in case you didn't take it down, you can always find that information by clicking the edit button. And to find your class, your class ID, the class ID is always to the left of the name. So those are two things that are pretty easy um, to find. So let's go into the test class itself. So I'm now in the test class. And as you notice, it says before you or your students can submit a paper, you first need to create an assignment. So Ms. Tugwell showed you from the student end um, what it looks like as a student. Now from our end, as an, a lecturer, I'm showing you what it looks like. We're gonna create an assignment, and I hope I'm not going too fast. I know it's 15 minutes over, so I'm trying to go as fast as possible. So we click add an assignment. It takes a moment to populate. And so while it populates, um, by then you would have had an idea of what type of assignment you want to create. So we're creating a test assignment. So let's call our assignment test. I, my start date is the eight. I can actually change the start date for the assignment. So it's not the date that I create the assignment, that is the start date. Um, that's the, the case only when you create a class. So I could change my start date to any, any time. All right. Um, then we click submit. If you notice, there are two options. Allow only file types that Turnitin um, can check for a similarity or allow any file type. All right. So I'm going to click submit. So I now have an assignment that has been created for my test class. Now, because an assignment has been created, while I was creating this new test class, Ms. Tugwell went ahead and she enrolled as a student because she was able to see the class enrollment, the class number and the enrollment ID, and she's now a student in this class. Now, this class does not have any um, assignments that have been submitted yet because it was just created. So we're gonna go back and we're going to go back to our assignments. And if you notice the status says zero assignments submitted. Now there are three important actions that you can take once you have created an assignment. You can edit the assignment. You can actually submit on a student's behalf. So let me click so I can show you. So I can choose from my computer. I can choose from Dropbox. I can choose from Google Drive. And I can fill in the information and I will, can submit on behalf of my students. Now you notice from the lecturer's standpoint, there's no option to save without submitting. You can't view the, sub, the similarity report unless you submit. So I just want to make that um, clear. And this is if you're submitting a single file upload on behalf of your students. 
So you go to actions, view, it shows you the three options. Um, it will show you the three options that you have um, under more actions, edit, submit, and you can also delete an assignment. All right. You can also look at your class list by clicking on students. You can add a student. So if I wanted to add uh, Ms. Tugwell instead of having herself enroll, it's a simple process, her name, her email address, and that's how I would add her. All right. Now, let's go back to our page, our main page. So on our main page, it has our account settings. So you can go in and change how many items you want to see per page, um, how many file uploads. So single file, multiple file uploads. In other words, if you check multiple file uploads, your students will be able to upload multiple files, which might mean the student can submit the same assignment um, several times. So it's when you click multiple file upload that that allows for that. Now let's go back to all our classes that we have so far. I'm going to go into the first class that we set up because I believe we have a paper that has been submitted in this class. So a test paper was submitted and I'm going to click on it. So it shows you what the workflow looks like when you are in Turnitin. So for this test scenario, we, we submitted a copy of the Turnitin Instructor's Manual from UWI. What it is in essence is um, the Turnitin information that's available, you we made a version for UWI, it's basically the same thing. It just has an information like how to um, get to the administrator and so on. So this is the paper that I submitted. Now, to the right is my match overview. Let me do it again. When I click on it, it shows where the information came from. Because this document comes from Turnitin, it's going to show 84% of this paper came from Turnitin. It also shows that this paper was submitted to the University of the West Indies. And the reason it's probably showing that is because it was submitted in this class. If, for example, I wanted to um, download my similarity report, I click on the download arrow, and here are the options. I can print my, I can download my digital receipt because Turnitin provides a receipt for every upload that you have. I can download my original original um, originally submitted um, file as well. So to get our receipt, we click on the download arrow, click on the digital receipt, we can download the original paper. But what if I want to download, what if I want to um, download other documents? And I'll get to that in a moment. Now what I've clicked on is um, the similarity index for all the sources that have come up in this paper. And so in, as you can see, Turnitin provides you with a solution to how, as to how to address um, this particular issue. All right. So it will say, um, this is what you can do. And it gives you an example of when a student has submitted a paper in the past and what you can do. So it does provide you with examples of um, how you can fix the problem. Again, in this paper, it shows the paper was submitted to graduate studies, uh, a postgraduate school rather. It was submitted to a university and Turnitin goes and gives you other um, places that it has been submitted. Right. And so that's um, your originality report. Now, let's click on online grading report. When you click on that, what you will see is um, we don't have the grading option. 
So if I pull that up, it's not, it's only going to show like an Excel um, sheet. And so it says grading service is not available for this assignment. And the reason it's not available is because we don't have um, that feature in our license. All right? You can also refresh your grade report if, if you know we had that option. But as you know, in this case, we don't. Again, let's view the assignment. Um, let's download it. Let's see if it opens. I just want to show you. Um, So as you can see, with practice, um, you'll become very versed at using um, Turnitin. It's taking a moment. Okay. And um, it, it downloads the paper as was submitted. And this is if you want to grade the paper um, offline outside of Turnitin. You can also opt to hide the similarity layers if you have already made a determination as to what you want to do um, with your students. Now, somebody has asked if there's, if you can set your personal acceptable similarity level. Um, we don't see an option for setting that within Turnitin, but I think as a lecturer, you can determine what percentage you would accept as um, not being plagiarism. So you could make, you could essentially make that um, turnitin, that um, determination, but but you would not be able to input that that percentage in turnitin. So in other words, you wouldn't be able to say to turnitin, okay, if a student has twenty four percent, they have not plagiarized. That would have to be a personal determination that um, you can you have made. We can take um, one more question and then we have to go. We have kind of gone um, over the time. Any questions? I get in again, but um, I was asking, you had mentioned the same about those five words that we could put in so that the student's name wouldn't be included. Where is that? Where's that option or where do we set that up, please? All right, so when you're um, setting up the assignment itself, let's see if we can go, let's go back to the assignment. One moment, please. Thanks. So in the edit section, All right, so when you're setting up the assignment, these are the options that you have available. You can generate a similarity report. You can exclude quoted materials from the similarity index for all papers in your assignment. So in other words, once a student has a quotation in their paper, you can tell Turnitin to, to ignore that. So the quotation would not come up in the percentages. Now, when you're grading the paper itself or when you're looking over the paper itself, that's when you would um, click on um, how many words you want to exclude. So let's go back to the paper. So that's one option.
trying to find it. Okay. All right, so here it is. Let me go to it. So it's under filters and settings, and you can exclude certain things. Let me exit out and go back so that you can see it. So in the first um, example, or the first option that I showed you, you can exclude certain things. So for example, quotations, you can exclude that when you're setting up the assignment. But in terms of the number of words you want to exclude, you can only do that once you're grading the paper itself. So you click on the filter option, which is this icon that looks like a filter. And then you can click on exclude quotes, exclude bibliography, and then you can put the number of words you want to exclude. Um, in a previous example, I'd said that Turnitin had um, excluded five words. It's up to you the number of words you want to exclude. So it can be five words. That's pretty reasonable. It, again, it's your determination. So the reason they would say five words is because that five words would typically take in, for example, your name or something else. Um, anything beyond that, then it's likely that the student could plagiarize. You can also exclude a certain percentage of the paper. Suppose you say 10% um, or 5%. And then you can apply your changes. And then you will see that it has excluded the percentage that you suggested. So the similarity match would be less. Filter and settings. You click on the percentage you want to exclude or the number of words you want to exclude. And then a new report um, would be generated. So you click new report. You refresh it and a new report would be created. Um, again, because we made changes, the report is not available. It takes time, and then you can download it. All right. If there are no more questions, I think that's our presentation on Turnitin. All right, just one, one more question. That five words thing, excluding five words, do you have to tell them what words you're excluding? So, for instance, you said your name. How does it know to leave out your name? Uh, it doesn't it doesn't give you the option to input any specific um, words it just gives you a number of words that will not be included in the um, similarity check and typically when you put five words it will automatically not count the person's name okay all right so it's not like it's it's saying it's not like it's going to give you an option to state what you want to exclude it doesn't do that I have a question, Moji Anderson. What happens if there are two lecturers on one course? Um, explain what do, what do you mean? What do you mean? It, so I, do I decide we decide who is going to set up this assignment and set up this class and all of that. All right. Well, if there are two lecturers for a course, then the way that you could um, work it out, you could have the other lecturer would have the credentials to the turn it in. Um, course is that how you're doing it because you would have to make that determination we couldn't tell you how you want to set up your class so i'm not quite sure i'm understanding um what you what you mean okay don't worry about it then okay. we know we have an option for a ta account so unless you would make one of you a teaching assistant and one person would have the main account or the main lecturer would provide the credentials to the other lecturer. So um, that's a determination that you would have to make. Well, I hope um, you'll be asked. Sorry, I have a very basic question, um, Michael Barnett here. Um, now, to my knowledge, just to get start, get 
access to the Turnitin account that UE has, we're supposed to be sent a, an email from MITS e-learning, is that, is that correct? So, can anyone hear me? Hello? Yes, we're hearing you, Doc. Okay, so, all right, I just want to know. What I was saying is, is that to, to, to set up my Turnitin account, um, you know, maybe I've gotten the wrong end of the stick, but I thought that we had to do this through MITS. I sent a, a request to them a couple of weeks back. I haven't heard anything. So, is there a... a a way of maybe I don't know. Split. At the very start, at the very start, Doctor Doctor Palmer had said that yes, you do need to get permission from MITS. Um, it is once you get permission from MITS that you do all that she has shown us here this evening. Right. Yeah, I, I came on a little bit late, so I missed that. But I thought that was the case. It's just what is very um, frustrating is that you know it's been about two two weeks. Well, um, in yesterday's faculty board meeting, uh, the dean told us that you should contact Dr. Delroy Chevers if you're having trouble with MITS. So perhaps you should tell Dr. Chevers and he can, he has some other direct links with MITS, so maybe he can help you. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I was thinking about that, but I was just wondering with the library staff here if there was uh, you know, another way. And of course, I missed the beginning of the meeting. So thanks a lot for that, all of you. Can students pre-submit their work to check themselves? It looks as if we've lost um, the audio, but I see Miss Togwell still typing, so perhaps she can type that for us. She would respond to Dr. Martin Hall. Though based on what I've heard this evening, I, I don't think so. I think once the lecturer sets them up, then they can do it for themselves, but um, I don't think students can just enter turn it in on their own. Certainly, UE says it doesn't have the licensing capacity, um, thousands of students. So it was MITS actually that suggested that the lecturers submit on behalf of students. All right, um, Ms. Togwell just responded to Dr. Martin Hall. Can students pre-submit their work to check themselves? She said they will have to be, they will need to be enrolled in order to submit. All right, if there are no other questions, um, do either of our speakers have anything to say just in closing? But if not, then I would just thank everybody. Uh, no, students cannot pre-submit. We can follow student. No, no, doc, no, Dr. Martin Hall, students can't pre-submit. All right, um, we're kind of falling apart here. So I just want to thank Dr. Palmer and Ms. Togwell for coming here and for helping us in the Faculty of Social Sciences to understand the Turnitin a little bit better. And um, it was a very useful presentation. I'm seeing quite a few comments of people thanking them and saying that they feel that they've been helped. Also remember that we have this presentation recorded and it will be available in the Dean's office and in the HRD Graduate Programs Unit. If you email me at spsw.assessment.centre, at gmail.com, spsw, sociology, psychology, social work, 
dot assessment dot center c n t r e at gmail dot com. I'll send it to you. And of course, um, Keisha Sherman Howell, she will be able to tell you how to get it from the dean's office. So with that, I would like to thank everybody, as I said, especially Ms. Togwell and Dr. Palmer for being here. And um, great job, very informative, and we'll call on you again if we have any problems, ladies. All right, thank you so much. Applause. I'm going to sign out from this meeting now. Um, okay, so thanks. Thanks. Bye.